The purpose of this video is to explain a little bit about LTI systems, where LTI stands for Linear Time Invariant, and uh, try to explain just why uh, LTI systems are such a great deal. So um, we'll begin with uh, what hopefully will make sense as a useful way to describe the situation. So. If I look at all possible systems, well, we'll actually say this is all possible single input, single output systems. So they live in some sort of, or this is a set of such systems. What we're going to do is we're going to dramatically restrict, restrict ourselves to only LTI systems. And the reason we're going to do this is that LTI systems, and we'll actually show in just a minute why this is such a good deal, but LTI systems are much more amenable to analysis. And we want to have an LTI system so bad that many times we'll take some system out here, some arbitrarily maybe time varying or you know, nonlinear system, and we'll make an approximation of it until it looks like an LTI system, and then we'll do the uh, control for the approximation and to hope that it works for the real system. Or we'll do the uh, uh, signal processing or whatever it is that needs to be done. But uh, LTI systems have such advantages that we're often willing to go to great lengths to approximate a system as an LTI system. So what are those advantages? Well, let's see if we can figure out a few. Um, if I have a linear time invariant system, I can represent, or I, I can, uh, let's see, how can I explain this? If I know the impulse response, and we'll come back to what the impulse response is in just a second, but if I know the impulse response, This is usually written as h of t. So if I know the impulse response of a linear time invariant system, I can figure out what the output of that system will be for any input. So the way you often see this represented graphically, we've got our system. x of t goes in, y of t comes out, and the impulse response um, relates the output to the input. The way that that is done is through the operation called convolution. And in another video I show how um, an LTI system, I actually show how the convolution integral is defined and, and worked out. So the way we write this is that y of t is equal to x of t, and then this is an asterisk, h of t. And this asterisk is uh, called convolving. Okay, so in order to get the output, I need to know the input, and I need to know the impulse response, which um, is a good deal, because now I've gone from maybe having to know all sorts of things about a system to just having to know one function. If I know this one function, I'm good. This impulse response is called the impulse response because it's the response of the system. Oops, I don't want to draw that down there. It's the response of the system to an impulse. So if I take a, a delta function and put that into the system, the output of the system is going to be h of t. Okay. A delta function, as you recall, is a, a function that's infinitely narrow and infinitely tall in such a way that it has a given area. And again, delta functions correspond in real life to uh, sudden shocks if you've got a mechanical system. So you uh, it's like hitting the system with a big hammer or um, some other large object that can apply 
uh, a huge amount of force or change speed uh, or, or something like that almost instantaneously. Uh, electrical systems, it's like uh, hitting your your system with a lightning bolt so you can change the charge in a capacitor almost instantaneously. So in real life we really don't want to find our impulse response of our system by putting an impulse in and getting the impulse response out because quite often putting the impulse in destroys the system and nothing useful comes out. So uh, later when we talk about um, transfer functions uh, we'll discover other ways of finding out what the impulse is rather than going about hitting things with hammers. So another another thing that uh, or another way that we can characterize the system is by what's called a transfer function. So that's a transfer function. And this ends up getting represented as H of S. Okay. And it turns out that the transfer function is used um, or is used in conjunction with the Laplace transform. That's what this S tells us is that we're dealing with the Laplace transform. And um, the the transfer function allows us to compute an output which is an input times the transfer function okay so this is this is actually showing us the reason that laplace transforms are so popular convolutions are in general quite difficult to compute um, I've done some example videos that show, uh, for simple cases, they're okay, but it can be it can be kind of hairy. If I use Laplace transforms, then the Laplace transform of my output is equal to the Laplace transform of my input times the transfer function. So I've taken something that looks like a hard thing to do in the time domain, and if I take Laplace transforms, I can do it fairly easily. One last way of characterizing this system is using Fourier, or I'm sorry, I just gave away the secret there, is using what's called a frequency response. And the frequency response is typically drawn H of J omega. Uh, J, as you will recall, is the engineering way to describe the square root of negative 1, and omega is a radian frequency. Um, so that's how you can tell that we we're talking about a frequency response. I've got omega as opposed to the S that I have in a transfer function, although they're very closely related. This is a Fourier transform. And the way this works, y of j omega is equal to x of j omega, h of j omega. Okay, so basically the Fourier transform of the output is equal to the Fourier transform of the input times the frequency response. And you'll notice that um, uh, y of s, or, or the the relationship for the Laplace transform looks the same as for the Fourier transform, except S is replaced by J omega. That's because I can compute a Fourier transform from a Laplace transform by replacing S by J omega. The Laplace transform and Fourier transform are very closely related. Uh, it turns out, though, that you can do different things with them. If you use the right version of the Laplace transform, you can take into account initial conditions. So that's often used for control systems, and Fourier transforms gives you things in terms of frequency, which is typically important for, uh, say, communication systems and such. So the fact that I can get the output with each of these three different things, with the impulse response, the transfer function, and the frequency response, makes you probably believe or hopefully believe that these things are related to each other, and indeed they are. 
I can get the transfer function from the impulse response by taking the Laplace transform of H. So um, H of S, this H of S here, is equal to the Laplace transform of H of T. And we'll go into this notation in more detail in a later video. Uh, for now, just think of this uh, funny script L as uh, representing the Laplace transform. So if I have H of T, I can get H of S. If I have H of S, I can do an inverse Laplace transform and get H of T. It also turns out that the frequency response is related by the Fourier transform to um, the impulse response. So the frequency response is the Fourier transform, where this is a script F of H. Okay. So in summary, the reason that I care so much about Laplace or linear time invariant systems is that one single function, again, we'll, we'll give this some majesty here. H of t tells us everything we need to know about the system. And once I know H of t, then I can compute H of s and H of j omega as necessary. It also turns out if I can figure out how to get H of s first, then I can compute H of t and H of j omega as necessary. And that's all due to the fact that I have a linear time invariant system. So we'll end the video there.